Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a platform on which we explore the trajectory of Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean. We look at the past, we look at where the country is at present, and we focus on the potential and opportunities for the future. Our topic for discussion today is strategizing and the relevance for Sri Lanka. This is an area in which we delve deep into trying to understand the requirement of planning, preparation, understanding where we can take the country with a proper plan of strategy and strategizing. For our program today, we have invited a person who earned his PhD at the University of Edinburgh. He taught at the University of St. Lawrence in the United States of America and is currently the head of the Department of Strategic Studies at the General Sir John Kotalavla Defence University. Dr. Harinda Vidanage, thank you very much for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding. Thank you, George, for having me. When we look at the past and we talk about strategizing in the island and we go back to the colonial period from 1505 onwards when we look at the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, they obviously had a plan. They had a strategy once they arrived here in terms of what they wanted to achieve. How have you seen that evolving? How did they strategize? What was it that we can take out of those periods? Well, George, uh, that is 16th century, and that was a time when Europe was becoming more of a very ep epicenter of everything, basically, because the question was, you know, Europe was very weak, you know, before 15th century, warring among each other, factions, but a certain set of agreements, principles, started bringing them together, and that made them started, they, they were becoming more prosperous, more capable. And of course, science, technology, rationality, these ideas were coming into play in Europe. A very simple example, you know, in 9th century, the Chinese invented gunpowder. But that was brought via the Arabs to European shores, and the Europeans mastered the cannon using science, physics, ballistics, and then mounted them on ships. And by the 18th century, they overran all Chinese positions using one, two gunboats in 48 hours. So this is what Europeans started doing uh, starting 16th century onwards. They definitely had a plan. And then they realized the importance of strategy because strategy played a main, main role. Strategy in a modern context. Strategy has history. They say even since primates, you know, strategy was there. But the strategy of the Europeans was to secure mainly commercial interests, mainly financial interests, you know, expansion, but commercial and financial. So mostly Portuguese, the Dutch, they started establishing what we call commercial bases. So that is why we have a lot of forts on the shores. So does Indonesia, so does Malaysia. The whole Asia Pacific, the whole archipelago, the, the Dutch and the Portuguese did what we called exterior, uh, exterior penetration setting up a front operation basis mainly for commercial purposes. So in that way, their, colon their colonization was to achieve a financial benefit, to make them flourish in Europe, create massive markets. So they created points of connections across the world. But then the British took strategy to a next deeper level. The British started what we call interior penetration. That is totally transforming the countries, the, 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 the geographies they took control of. So that is politics plus economics, which enabled the British to transplant a model of governance, which we are still using. Right? So by the 18th, 19th century, by 19th century in Europe, the, na the state, the nation state became the, the key structure of governance and they just brought the blueprint to our shores. And that's a strategy par excellence. Still, the system prevails. That is why, for a certain uh, you know, reasons, why the, 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 there is a cer certain Western dominance in the world, because this model is theirs. And they indigenized it to us, and we indigenized from them. So that's the strategy, I think. It was a brilliant strategy. It has worked very effectively yes. from uh, their perspective. Their least, perspective. When you look at it yeah. from a yeah. Western prism. Now, when we look at Sri Lanka and independence, 1948 onwards, it was entirely in our hands. And now it was up to us to decide how we were going to strategize for the future. How effective has our plan been from 48 onwards? 
George, it's a very interesting uh, period because 48 is exactly the what we is, is what we call the post Second World War era. That was the era when strategy started to be studied in universities with international security and international relations focuses. So countries were looking at the strategic thinking, the so-called strategic thinking started coming into statecraft. So Sri Lanka got independence when the Westerners were starting to study statecraft strategic thinking, right? Universities, uh, think tanks, corporate heads, Rockefeller, you know, Ford Foundation, everything was, you know, working to think about strategy. So that, that's the beginning of what we call strategic studies. Uh, it's as a discipline. So Sri Lanka, and we didn't have that, but I think our strategy was, our, our strategy was pretty much governed by how we looked at the world. So for Sri Lanka, the cho there were, at that moment, there were limited choices because after the Second World War, the world quickly divided between two I political ideologies, secular ideologies, capitalism versus communism. So as a country, we had to understand the changes of that particular, what we call planetary, at a planetary level. But then Sri Lanka's, I think, journey engagement with the world was pretty much charted by the ideas of non-alignment, which was, the, which was the, the common thread which bound all the new states, mm -hmm. the so-called decolonized states. So our future was pretty much charted across the non-alignment movement that is trying to stay, to a certain extent, to engage but to stay neutral. I think that is the that was the challenge. I, I feel our clarib calibrations of non-alignment was not as robust as, for example, take India. Uh, since I am an educationist, I always take the example of how, how India's technological educational dominance in the world now, right? IT experts worldwide. You, the big companies may be American or Dutch or British, but the minds are Indian. The USB drive was invented by India, and you know, you know so, so many things. How? Because of, the, of how Nehru established the IITs, right? In, Indian Insti Institution of Technologies. One was supported by the Americans, one was funded by the Germans, one was funded by the Russians. That's non-alignment being used to calibrate your own destiny. So I think Sri Lanka could have done better. Absolutely. When you look at, when you focus on Jawaharlal Nehru himself, and we go back to that very famous Bandung summit yes. uh, in 1955, where he asked other countries, aren't you ashamed to go under another form of colonialism in terms of the Cold War and what mm -hmm. was happening? And that was where he united a very diverse, a very different country under one banner of being yes. Indian. Yes. Uh, and that program of strategy really paid off. And they're really s reaping the dividends mm -hmm. of uh, what they did uh, back then. When we come back with our next segment, we're going to focus on where we are at present. What are the challenges that we are facing? Are we strategizing? Are we not strategizing? This is what we're going to focus on when we return to our next segment. We are in conversation with Dr. Harinda Vidanage, the head of the Department of Strategic Studies at the General Sergeant Kotalavni Defense University. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. Our focus today is on strategizing and its relevance for Sri Lanka. We're in conversation with the head of the Department of Strategic Studies at the Kotalavra Defence University, Dr. Harinda Vidanage. Dr. Vidanage, before the break, we talked about the past. We looked at the trajectory of Sri Lanka from independence onwards. When you look at other countries around the world, a lot of emphasis is being placed on this notion of strategizing or the need for it. In Sri Lanka, what have been the main challenges for an effective program of strategizing in terms of policy formulation, policy implementation? What do you see have been the main challenges? See, George, strategy, you know, from my perspective, in the discipline, even among scholars of strategy now, there is a bit of a frustration saying that strategy has been so diluted because now we have things like business strategy, marketing strategy, but it is a history. Uh, though we are going to speak of the present, let me take one minute and speak about the history of how did strategy become such a, from a narrow thing of winning a war, 
of statecraft to something that is about organizations. This also happened in the 40s. Uh, you know, uh, in the US, uh, because I used to you, you go to the US because that's the heart of strategic studies. Uh, and that's where strategy became kind of infused with other subjects like management, right? We, uh, in 1937, a young immigrant came to the US. His name was Peter Drucker, Austrian born Jewish immigrant fleeing Adolf Hitler. The same time, you know, people you and I like, you know, scholars such as Hans J. Morgan, who, you know, uh, Kenneth Waltz, who all, you know, behind the origins of the, the discipline of international relations. Drucker got, op Drucker got opportunity to work with uh, Alfred Sloan, the, the CEO of, of uh, Ford Corporation. And he got access to, of 18 months to work at Ford to see how Ford functioned. Uh, and the, uh, sorry, not Ford, uh, sorry, General Motors. Ford uh, was a different. And, and he, through his experience, started writing books and textbooks. He made management a discipline, right? And he, the, 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 the thing he did was he identified a business as an organization. And organizations need management. Manager was an Italian term of origin which said, the person who can master riding a horse using the hands. That's how you become a manager. So the, this idea of how organizations could, is part of, is, is a separate study area and the need of strategy to run those organizations. That became the heart of organizational thinking. That is why you have things like business strategy, market strategy. That's all Drucker's work, infusing military thinking into organizational behavior, analyzing and how and to contribute to functions of organizations. So coming to back to Sri Lanka, we are in dire need of strategic thinkers. Strategy in Sri Lanka has been very short term, had been very short sighted. Uh, strategy sometimes has been confined with political class, uh, caste interests in politics as well as in business, right? Countries which have been successful has seen the need to strategize through organizations, through their businesses, as well as the statecraft. So I think Sri Lanka has done certain things well, like our education strategies. You know, we are in the forefront of education, has the highest literacy rate in the region. But also we, our human capital is still stagnant in certain ways. We have a great human capital, but how does that capital contribute to organizational behavior, organizational development, public sector, private sector? I think these are areas where we still need strategic vision, strategic thinking, because strategy is all about going, f taking a journey from one place to the another. The strategy is being aware of knowing your starting point, but you don't know exactly where you're going to end, but the ambition. Basically, how do you use limited resources to make maximum gains. Or from a statecraft perspective, if you're a leader with so much of aspirations, how do you control your aspirations and channel them to achievable targets? You can be the best leader with so many aspirations, but you need to channel them to achieve targets. So I think Sri Lanka still needs, there is some work in progress. There's a lot that we can understand from that because even if you look at us on an individual basis, mm. we strategize every day. Yes. When you get up in the morning and yeah. you set out of home for work or for some journey, you know where you want to get to. You yeah. know the time it's going to take you to get there. So we do it on a very uh, individual perspective in terms of how we want to get something, whether it's education, whether you're planning for a program. And um, you look at some of the larger countries on the global stage. Countries like China talk about the two centenary anniversaries that they're trying to mark their mm. lead, the, which one, one is being marked right now, the other one is the founding of their country. There's so much in terms of what other countries are doing within this field. And this is something that we really can e understand the experiences that they have gone through and something that we can relate to Sri Lanka in terms of how we are uh, going forward. When we come back with our next segment, we will be focusing on the journey, the journey from now into the future, how we are going to be able to strategize, how we are going to be able to understand the synergy of strategy and how we are going to take it forward. We are in conversation with Dr. Harinder Vidhan. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. 
Our focus today is on strategizing and the relevance for Sri Lanka. We are in conversation with Dr. Harinda Vidanage, the head of the Department of Strategic Studies at the General Sir John Kotalavla Defence University. Dr. Vidanage, before the break, you talked about the past. We looked at the period up to independence, we looked at independence onwards. You currently head the only strategic studies department at the tertiary level in Sri Lanka. That's the only one of its kind yeah. that we have in the island. Isn't it time that we focus a lot more on this area, whether it be through education, whether it be national level in terms of policy making? Isn't it time that we do that? Others are doing it. I'm not talking about the large countries, countries in our neighborhood, smaller countries in our neighborhood, they're all doing it. Exactly, Josh. You know, we always talk about how great our education system is and was. It is, and it was. But the yawning gap, not just in Sri Lanka, in many countries which they are coming to term, is that there is a massive, what we call, policy divide between the academia, and the which means the, acad and the education system, and the how the policy works. So a strategic studies department is the ideal instrument, is the ideal bridge that can bring together communities of policy making and communities of academia. That is why we at the Department of Strategic Studies is training and educating our students, not just to be academics, not just to be professionals, but also think in terms of policy. Because if you want to have a strategic vision and if you want to strategize, you need to understand the workings of policy, right? You can be the best thinker, but if you can't apply that into policy realms, your contribution is very minimal. That's an area where we are really struggling. That's why we see more students being deployed as foot soldiers to be as protesters, right? We are perpetuating uh, uh, incapability, a uh, backwardness, and maintaining that. What we actually want to do is break it. We don't want to sustain a class of educated, backward, you know, incompetent set of people. Some people can thrive on such a community. We don't want to do that. We want to, because education is the future, it's emancipation, it's the contribution to social, political development of any country. So we bring people to the best education institutions in the country, and then we make them stagnant. And then we make them foot soldiers for a cause. That's not the way forward. So here at KDU, at the Department of Strategic Studies, we have introduced a new degree program called Strategic Studies and International Relations. That's a hybrid where we train our students the statecraft, diplomacy, strategic communication, but also students, they're all Sri Lankan by heart. You know, their, their heart is in the country. And they know through this degree they can, be a they, they can perform well both in the public and the corporate sector. So that is the strategic thinking behind the Strategic Studies Department. And that's something I personally believe we should really foster. And other universities, I hope, could you know, take this model. Because studying strategy and strategizing, that's where the gap is. So we are strategizing to bridge the gap. That's what we are doing. Filling that gap, that yawning gap that you mentioned, yeah. that is something that we really need really to do. Need. Taking the theory into the practice. practice. As we go into the future, how are we going? You talked about how the KDU is trying to do that through your department, and hopefully at the national level, we're going yes. to see that happening on a much larger scale. But as individuals, as communities, as society, where do you see us going in the future? Where do you see the potential of this field? What can we achieve through this? Uh, George, uh, actually the world, everybody is in a status of what we call strategic shock at the moment. Developed countries, developing countries, because of the COVID-19 catastrophe. The COVID-19 catastrophe has shown us, how, though our strategizing has been so compartmentalized, we have lived in silos. So it's time, and, and that is why no, every government is struggling to, to make its citizenry realize how to respond. Because none of us, most people are not strategically thinking. We are thinking in, in very short term, you know, we are, we are, we are all in, uh, lost in tunnel visions. Strategic thinking is, you know, getting us across. So, so I think uh, that is where strategy should be understood in a in a perspective in, in a broader perspective. That is understanding how things are changing, 
how the world is moving forward, how the region is changing from a state, you know, state level, the geopolitical comp uh, competitions that's unraveling around us, how that's going to, Im Im you, know, uh, you know, we can never escape this, right? And also as at, a, at, a, at a personal level, how we can develop our relationships, how we can, the, the expansion of insight. Strategic thinking only allows expansion of insights. For that to happen, people should be very aware of their past, of their present, and where they're going. That's why Sri Lankan citizens should be citizens with a conscience, as well as with a past, right? Not a history to boast to, but a history to look for, to, to learn and to look forward and, to, and learn from our own mistakes as well. That's why things like history, humanities, social sciences, these are integral aspects of any education program. You know, countries have liberal arts. Sri Lankans, you know, our systems, it's, we do not try to integrate that. In, in the US, you can be a medic, but you still learn philosophy, you learn how to dance. In Sri Lanka, we should think of that. If not, we will have a citizenry who's always backward, who's always negative, who's always protesting, but not seeing the best, and not seeing the challenges as they are. We are seeing, I think we are seeing too many demons, and we, we, we are also uh, succumbing to all the monsters we have created by ourselves. So the best way to go forward circumvent that is to be strategic thinkers, to see the vision, to be able to bold enough to take that step. To be strategic is, is me, when you, the moment you say I'm a strategic person, that means I know to circumvent or bypass a challenge. If not, I will succumb to that. I will stay indoors. I will be, I will be always hiding. For example, COVID-19, for, for a long time, most countries has been trying to hide. Isolation is hiding, is, you know, we have to, to isolate, but we have to also look forward. How to work that, working from home, using online technologies, that, and how to provide those to the citizen, you know. So that is strategic thinking. Absolutely, and when we talk, you mentioned how we face challenges, but we need to be able to convert them into opportunities. Mm. This is where we really probably lack and the yawning gap is mm. there, not only in converting the theory into practice, but also understanding our own potential on an individual basis and the contribution that we can make. As we go into the future, we begin to realize, we begin to understand that something that we really need, we really need to focus on is this notion of strategizing. Where are we going? Where do we want to get to? And then decide how we are going to get there whether this is on an individual basis, whether it's on the national level, whether it is in terms of our international connectivity, where we are taking the country, where we are going, what the journey is going to be. So in terms of overcoming the challenges, converting them into opportunities, this is all a part and parcel of strategizing. Thank you very much, Dr. Vidhanagay, for joining us on the Sri Lankan Understanding, uh, where we focused on strategizing and the relevance for Sri Lanka. There is a lot that can be done, should be done, and will be done. It's in our hands to do it. Join us again next time on the Sri Lankan Understanding when we explore a similar area of notion of understanding where we want to take the country and the potential for the future. Thank you.